So in the next few days from when I'm making this video, we're going to be getting even more images from the Orion Nebula taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. And specifically there are going to be some images of the iconic baby stars, including images involving very unusual phenomena and very unusual structures that we're still trying to understand even today. Such as the unusual object you see right here. We've actually discussed this at least once on the channel before, but these unusual formations are actually some of the most important objects James Webb is trying to study. These are known as herbic haro objects, and for the most part they all sort of look the same. They resemble long nebula with somewhat symmetrical shapes on both sides. And we've briefly discussed one of these objects, released by the James Webb relatively recently, because in this image there was actually an unusual formation resembling a question mark, accidentally found inside the image, whose origin is still not understood. But we didn't really get to discuss this object itself, and of course similar formations, which is exactly what I wanted to do today for one simple reason. More images are going to be released very soon, and so it's important to understand what this all means. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in the next few days we're going to be getting the image of this, Herbic Haro 212, yet another one of these objects, somewhat mysterious objects, that the scientists are trying to understand a little bit better. And the thing is, when these objects were originally discovered, for the most part, they basically resembled unusual nebular clouds with somewhat unusual features inside, and also very often located in other popular nebula such as the Orion Nebula, but initially discovered by two scientists, Dr. Herbig and Dr. Haro. Here's actually the first object that they found, this is known as the HH1 and 2, mostly because they thought this is two objects, even though technically this is actually just one single object. Nevertheless, there are two clouds. And while over the years, many many such objects have been discovered in the Milky Way with a lot of different properties and somewhat different shapes. Always long, always symmetrical, and usually associated with various molecular clouds. But it wasn't until the observations from this object, HH47, that the initial mystery was kind of finally solved. The scientists discovered something else right in the middle, right between all of the nebula a protoplanetary disk. Essentially, as you can probably guess, because all of these objects were located in molecular clouds, it became pretty clear that these are forming stars. Here's another one known as HH30. And here's the image of one of these disks, taken by the ALMA telescope, inside the object HH212. The same object that's going to be revealed by the James Webb really soon. And so in essence, it didn't take long to figure out that this is basically baby stars. But not like any baby stars super super young baby stars, essentially not even stars yet. These are objects that are only thousands of years old, that are slowly moving closer and closer to the center, growing the central object larger and larger, and essentially forming a protostar. Even though right now it's most likely just a very thick cloudy region, with something massive in the middle accumulating a lot of gas. And all of this becomes particularly obvious if you look at these objects with the James Webb in the infrared light. So this is the object HH4647 that sort of looks like this in visible light. Here you don't really see the star or the central region, but it becomes super obvious and super apparent if you look at it in the infrared. Which is exactly why the James Webb has become the primary telescope to study these objects. Because of the dusty regions, it's almost impossible to see anything here, as the dust generally covers a lot of optical light. But the infrared goes through the dust, revealing absolutely everything. And so various researchers studying the evolution of stars and specifically focusing on baby stars have been actively requesting more time on the James Webb to take more of these pictures. And so this is what we get next. With the previous object being HH211 that you see right here and HH212 being the next. And so first, what exactly is going on here? Well, as you can see, it's not really difficult to understand. We have a protostar somewhere in the middle, in this case almost invisible, and we of course have a bunch of other objects, including a newly evolved protostar, because all of this is once again in the Orion Nebula. But unlike other objects in the Orion Nebula, in this case HH212 is really young, very likely less than 50,000 years old. And we can actually measure the age of these objects by doing one simple thing, by essentially looking at these objects for many years and then measuring the velocity of the nebula as it spreads across. And in this case, almost every time they move at very fast velocities, usually at least several hundred kilometers per second. And so here, after about 20 years of observations, 
it becomes pretty obvious how much the gas here moved away from the center. Allowing the researchers to figure out the age of the object, what's most likely happening in the middle, and what sort of a star it might form eventually. Although for the most part, for many of these questions, the answers are usually still a little bit uncertain. But I guess more importantly, this is very likely how the solar system began as well. As a matter of fact, it looks like most if not all stars begin this way. And here's actually one mystery. Turns out that the much more powerful emissions from these HH objects usually occur in binary systems, or I guess growing binary systems. And it turns out that about 80% of all of these objects are very likely binary. But based on observations from Gaia Telescope, we know that the majority of stars don't seem to be binary and instead seem to be single, which implies that maybe there is some kind of a transition between a young star and a mature star, where essentially one of the stars escapes and creates its own star system, although I guess more realistically, this is just one of those mysteries the researchers are trying to solve. Why is it that there are 80% of potentially binary baby stars that then end up mostly becoming singular stars? And so this is hopefully what the James Webb is going to help us a little bit more. But I guess the initial question to answer here is, what's really happening on the inside? Why do we see these structures and why is it so common everywhere? Today is believed there are approximately 150,000 such objects in the Milky Way. Most are too far for us to see, but statistically that's what's believed based on the observations near us. And so this is actually a universal mechanism that doesn't just apply to stars. It applies to galaxies, it applies to anything that starts spinning. As the molecular gas starts to accumulate into tighter and tighter clouds, and starts to slowly create some kind of an accretion disk inside the protoplanetary system, things closer to the center are going to start rotating much faster. But the thing is, if things rotate too fast, nothing will actually condense in the middle and the entire object is just going to fly apart completely. And so something has to get rid of some of this angular momentum. And though it's not entirely clear how exactly all of this works, the overall process potentially looks something like this. Just like with black holes, the accretion disk contains quite a lot of ionized particles, which start forming powerful magnetic lines around this object. And because things here are also spinning, these magnetic lines will start getting entangled, capturing some of the material from the disk inside these magnetic fields, and then throwing everything out through two poles formed away from the center. In this case, it might involve magnetic snapping, where basically the magnetic lines snap, releasing all of the material at once, or it might involve some other mechanism. Although because we tend to see these objects moving away as large chunks as if there was a major emission, the magnetic snapping right now is most likely the best explanation. And over time this produces these objects that are usually at least 3 to 10 light years in length, that are basically formed as a result of these very powerful fast moving emissions interacting with all of the gas inside the molecular cloud. And so it's basically the very fast moving particles striking the cloud that then start producing these visible observations. With all of this gas carrying away not just the angular momentum from the central accretion disk, but also taking with it a lot of different elements from the cloud, which then, due to their extremely fast velocities, initiate complex chemical reactions. And so in essence, this also serves as an extremely important chemical enrichment process, which dramatically changes the molecular makeup of the entire cloud with a lot of this material potentially used in other stars nearby or possibly in future stars forming in this region. Although for the most part, about 99% of everything here is just hydrogen and helium. But the remaining 1% of stuff does actually produce relatively complex molecules. For example, things like metal hydrides, sometimes seen in various nebula, are believed to be produced in these very unusual shock-induced reactions which very likely starts when some of these unusual clouds move at slightly different velocities, with the faster cloud catching up with the slower cloud, snacking into it, initiating all of these chemical reactions. And so a huge amount of various molecules have been actually seen inside these clouds, suggesting that a lot of different baby stars as they formed very likely influenced the chemical composition of future stars nearby. But all of this only lasts for a few thousand years, because at some point the star matures stops creating so many powerful emissions and eventually starts forming planets. Although intriguingly, in terms of the amount of material lost as the star grows, it's actually relatively significant. Anywhere from 1 to 10% of the solar mass seems to be lost every single year inside these jets. 
and though eventually the star will actually grow much larger and much more massive, 10% is still a significant loss. Although in terms of the actual mass, it usually only amounts to like one millionth of a solar mass per year. Nevertheless, still quite a powerful and obviously quite an important process that seems to be universal pretty much everywhere. But I guess what I'm really curious about is what exactly are the scientists going to discover here? This is the next image that's going to be released, but we don't really have any scientific data just yet. Nevertheless, maybe in the next few weeks or in the next few months, future studies might provide additional answers about how all of this works and what exactly happens here as these very unusual objects evolve over time. And so I guess once there are additional images, additional studies and more discoveries, we'll come back and talk more about this because there are still so many mysteries and so many unanswered questions. But the main reason I really wanted to talk about this is because of how important this phenomenon is for all stars in the entire universe. Because it's assumed that all stars out there very likely start the same way. And so trying to understand what exactly is happening here will definitely answer a lot of questions about star evolution. But we'll talk more about this in some of the future videos. Check out some of the previous videos in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.